So I want to start um, because you basically hit some like touched. The, the book is a sort of a history of not sort of, but a history of the relationship <laughs> between the press and president and the presidency, but particularly sort of, uh, I guess, watershed relationships over the course of American history that brought us to where we are today uh, with this relationship. So let's, you know, sort of reverse engineer this. Where are we today in terms of this dynamic between the presidency and the press? Oh, I think we are in troubled times in terms of that dynamic, but it's not the first time we've been in troubled times. Uh, in terms of that dynamic, and I, I'm sure your listeners are are well aware of a lot of the problems that we face today uh, in terms of how the media covers the presidency and how uh, presidents uh, in recent years, particularly Donald Trump, have have attacked uh, journalists. Uh, but it's not the first time, and my book starts with with John Adams uh, in in the 1790s and his attack on. Uh, newspaper writers and, and editors of the day uh, with the Sedition Act, when when more than a hundred uh, people were prosecuted for daring to say or write something that was critical of the government or critical of the press, and the Federalists in power, including John Adams, uh, and, and they controlled Congress and they controlled the courts, uh, went after anybody uh, who was critical. Uh, of the president and and the government, and it ended up uh, as a result uh, shutting down newspapers uh, and and curbing free speech and, and a free press. But in the end, it came back to to bite John Adams uh, uh, because he lost the, the election to Thomas Jefferson, and one of the reasons was because of the popular distaste uh, for his Sedition Act. Um, all right. Well, then let's um, you know let. Uh, let's jump to um, uh, one of the next big moments that develops this is, is Abraham Lincoln. Um, and that's a big jump. Um, it, it, what, what, why, why does it, you know, where is the lineage between what happens with Adams and with Lincoln or, you know, how, how do we see this in the context of the development of a relationship? Right. So I, I decided I wasn't going to try to cover every president because that, that could be an extremely long book. Uh, so I picked 10 of them whose presidencies I think really reflected some key moments in terms of, of, of that dynamic. And sort of the through line between John Adams, John Adams, uh, we just talked about, tried to suppress the press. Uh, Lincoln, in probably the time of our nation's greatest crisis, the Civil War, uh, the Union military, as well as the Confederacy, uh, did try to restrict uh, the press as well uh, and, and limit their coverage of what was going on in, in the war. Uh, but what I really focus on in, in the Lincoln chapter is the power of the press to influence a president. Uh, Lincoln wasn't an abolitionist to start with. He, he, he was anti-slavery, but he wasn't uh, in favor of abolishing slavery where it already existed. Uh, but uh, through the abolitionist press, which started as a, as a very small segment of, of, the, of the press at that time, it was considered a fringe radical group uh, for much of the eight, early 1800s, uh, gradually grew more influence, grew more, grew more readers. Uh, Lincoln's law partner, William Herndon, subscribed to abolition news, abolitionist newspapers, would read them to him. And once Lincoln became president, uh, he actually invited abolitionist uh, editors uh, and leaders, such as Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, to talk with him in the White House. And through their pressure, their influence in the Republican Party, uh, he needed them to, to win re-election in 1864. Lincoln's moral compass of, of being opposed to slavery began to gradually align with his political and his strategic compass of, of wanting to win the war and win re-election. And the abolitionist press was part of the reason uh, he did that. Uh, through their pressure, through talking to him, uh, they got him to support the Emancipation Proclamation and then to support the 13th Amendment. What's the what's the calculus that is is used when a president is pushed by the press? I mean, I think like on some level, you know, from my perspective, um, we have that problem. You know, this also applies to really the Demo you know, the, to the leadership of, of the parties. Um, and, you know, we see I don't know if you can say you can see Republicans responding to, say, like Fox News as much as working in tandem. Right. right. I mean, it doesn't even seem to be necessarily enough daylight between them. Uh, but. Certainly, you see, like the the Democratic leadership respond to a what seems to be an, an increasingly insignificant 
circle of media, you know, uh, the Sunday talk shows and maybe a couple of other shows. Um, but where does the like when the abolitionist press comes and, and tries to convince uh, Lincoln of that he should be more aggressive in rolling back slavery, where what's the leverage? Is it is it that he's worried that is it that he thinks they represent a perspective or he thinks that they will uh, undercut his support amongst their readers? Well, I think uh, that's a great question. And I, I think the answer is is yes to both. Uh, they, you know, Lincoln and uh, smart politicians and other eras understand that the press, uh, however it exists in, the, in their era, you know, then, then it was mostly newspapers, some magazines uh, in Lincoln's day, a few, a few pamphlets. Uh, now, obviously, it's everything from social media to television to radio to, to print and, and everything else that's online, podcasts like yours. Uh, so a smart, a smart politician, especially a president, is going to understand that uh, that media uh, can influence uh, their listeners, their audience to, to support uh, or support them in their policies or, or go against them and their policies. And you, you mentioned Fox News. Uh, a few moments ago in, in the connection with the Republican Party. And I talk quite a bit about that in my book, how uh, the Republican Party uh, really began to, to merge uh, with right-wing media uh, starting uh, really during the George W. Bush administration and almost really became one and the same in, in some respects. We, we know about the revolving door between the Trump administration and Fox News. Uh, we know that when uh, right-wing talk radio hosts uh, went after bipartisan immigration, uh, effort uh, during the Bush administration, yep. and then later the Obama administration, uh, and got their listeners uh, to oppose it, uh, that then the Republican politicians who are afraid of being called rhinos, Republicans in name only, backed off. Uh, so it, that gets to your question that they, smart politicians like Lincoln can recognize the power uh, of the media to, to influence the electorate influence people who might be their supporters, influence people who might uh, come out against them. So it's almost like a, I mean, maybe not so veiled threat in, in some instances, right? I mean, you know, it, it's, it's much easier to see it for me, uh, you know, on the right than, than you know, uh, with Republicans than Democrats, like contemporaneously, because um, there isn't the same infrastructure, media infrastructure on the, you know, the, the center to center left. And it's just not as and and in some ways they act as like a a buffer. They're they're far less representative, it seems to me, of the Democratic voter than the than Fox is and and uh, talk radio is of the Republican voter. But let maybe let's 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 come to that in a bit because I want to jump to uh, from uh, the 1860s when um, when Lincoln made that shift to um, the uh, 1917 uh, with Woodrow Wilson, they, um, they used, uh, or the administration used, uh, I guess, fairly recent legislation um, as a way of prosecuting journalists. This is in the, in the, in the context of uh, World War I. Um, give us a, a sense of, of like why, why Woodrow Wilson? You know, Wilson uh, came into office as a great proponent that uh, a president should work with the press uh, to the further the interest of the nation. Uh, but Wilson did not have the personality to do that successfully. He'd been president of Princeton and a longtime professor, and he tended to, to lecture the press as if they were dim-witted students rather than people uh, serving uh, a important role in a, in a democracy. He was the whole, first to hold press conferences, uh, but they went terribly because of his sort of stern approach to journalists and he wanted them to be more stenographers. And anytime they asked a, a challenging question, he would he would bristle and, and, and shut it down. So he had a very tense relationship with, with journalists to begin with. Then when World War I started, uh, or the United States entered World War I, I should say, uh, he was very much uh, in favor of cracking down on any kind of dissent. Uh, whether it was in the press or, or, or free speech. And he and his congressional allies passed and, and signed three really draconian laws. One was the Trading with the Enemies Act, one was the Espionage Act, and the third was another version of the Sedition Act, uh, going back to what John Adams did. 
And they were so severe that uh, there was a gentleman in Washington who uh, wrote a book saying war is wrong. Uh, he was prosecuted and, and put into jail. Uh, there was a, a Reverend uh, Clarence Waldron wrote that uh, Christians should not fight. Uh, he was arrested and, and put in jail. Uh, the Masses, which was a sort of liberal progressive uh, newspaper of its day, had some critical cartoons and articles about the war effort. Uh, their cartoonist and, and several of their journalists uh, were prosecuted. The whole uh, publication had to shut down as a result. And there's a real climate of, of, of fear. Uh, there, were, there were vigilantes going around you know, cities and towns across the United States uh, looking for people who might oppose the war effort, might oppose the draft, uh, and cracking down on them. Uh, there was a, a socialist newspaper in Milwaukee, The Leader, it was actually published by a, a congressman. He was a, he was a socialist who had been elected to Congress, Victor Berger, uh, and the Postal Service uh, basically shut it down. Uh, and Victor Berger was arrested uh, for uh, violating the Espionage Act because he uh, thought that the uh, corporations were profiting too much from war, and he wrote about that. Uh, so he went to jail and was finally released on a technicality. So it was a, a real period of suppression, and it, it shows the danger of a president who has too much power. And it's really during times of war uh, that we often see that, uh, although during Trump's administration, we, we certainly saw a president who tried to do the same thing. What, what was the, how did, how did, how was there a rollback from that? I mean, was it just at the end of the war? Was, I mean, what, what did it, did those, and I, and I feel like even under the Obama administration, we saw some of the, the return of the Espionage Act deployed against um, uh, the press in exactly. this country. Yeah, um, Obama. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, but that was, you know, at the time as this was happening, I remember we were saying, like, this hasn't been used in 100 years. And, and, and it was Wilson who had used it. How did it well, how did the ramp down happen? How do you yeah. un unwind that? Right. Yeah, you're exactly right. Obama dusted off the Espionage Act from 1917, and, and he used it more often against, uh, or his administration, I should say, used it more often against leakers uh, than all other presidents combined uh, before him. So how did it roll back? You're, you're right. It was largely the end of the war. The war. Uh, no longer that great climate of, of fear uh, that uh, the United States was in this life and death struggle uh, for democracy, although we could we could question whether it was really for democracy. Uh, and it was also partly because Wilson went so far uh, with it and had bred so much mistrust with the press that when he wanted uh, to get the Senate to pass the League of Nations, uh, Wilson spent a number of months in Paris negotiating with the French and the British over over the terms of the of the German surrender and what what the what the peace would look like afterwards. Uh, but he really shut off the press uh, from what those discussions entailed uh, and the reporters who were there. And there were many reporters covering it. It was a big story of the day. Uh, but the reporters who were there were, were shut out uh, from what Wilson was thinking, what his administration was trying to do in terms of forming Wilson's great dream, which was the League of Nations. So in the in, in the void uh, of, of information from from Wilson, uh, the Republicans who opposed Wilson were quite willing to fill that void with uh, their arguments against the League of Nations, and, and and by the time Wilson returned to the United States, public opinion had already mounted uh, against the League of Nations, uh, against Wilson's uh, big grand vision, and he was never able to get it through the Senate, uh, and partly due to his own fault uh, in not really using the press to to promote his ideas. I have a little theory about that. That is um, that that he had that flu, and he was losing mm -hmm. his mind. Uh, but I don't know if that was, I mean, there's some people who have, um, who have yeah, there's a debate among historians. Did he have the, the Spanish flu, uh, which might've done that. Uh, others say he just, he just had some strokes, uh, and that he had deteriorated. Uh, but, but Wilson's disdain for the press was long before that as well. Right. So, uh, it was only intensifying a, a, a habit he already had.